Hey friends, I'm Gretchen Saffles from Life Lived Beautifully, and I'm excited to join you today as we begin a discussion about how to study the Bible. Um, this is the beginning of a video series we're going to do called Well-Watered Women. And um, we're going to go into different ways, different things about the Bible, ways to equip you in your own Bible study, and even ways to use your Give Me Jesus journal. Um, last May, the Lord led me to create the Give Me Jesus journal, and since then, we've sold over 2,000 journals to women across the world. And since we've sold them, I've had still several women contact me and ask me the question, how do you practically study the Bible? How do we actually open this up, and how... Do we use our journals every day and spend time in the Word of God? And so over these next few videos, that's the, some of the questions I want to answer. Um, and these actually go off of some of the things that you have specifically asked. And one thing I've noticed um, and that I used to do whenever I was little is um, I had this whole idea of what a quiet time was supposed to look like. So it included a cup of coffee, a certain time of day, um, a perfect pen, because y'all all know what I'm talking about. You have to have the perfect pen, um, a journal, and all of these things. And I would think about this, and I'd go, oh, man, that sounds so good. And then when it came to actually doing it, I really didn't know what to do. <laughs> I would have this whole picture, and I would open up my Bible and my journal and go, okay, where do I start? <laughs> and so um, one of the purposes of this video is that we take that idea and that hungering and that longing to know the Lord, and we actually put it into action. Because a lot of the times we actually need to just to know what to do. And um, God doesn't want us to just live with ideas. He wants to actually spend time with us. He wants for us to come to him. And there's so many examples in the Bible of people coming early in the morning to spend time alone with the Father. And one of the most important examples we see is in Mark 135, when Jesus comes early in the morning to pray and to spend time with the Father. And right after that, we see in Scripture, he had new direction of what to do. He actually went to a new city to preach the word. And so that's one of the purposes that we come um, early in the morning or late at night, whatever time of day is best for you to spend time with the Lord. And I love Psalm 143, 8. And this verse is actually in the beginning of the Give Me Jesus journal. And it says, Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. And so um, there's a real, these verses show just a real yearning and hungering after the word. And I know that even if you're watching this video, video you have that inside of you. And, um, and I speak to you today just as somebody who's being taught about this. I don't know everything about having quiet times. I don't know everything about studying the Bible. But just in my own hungering and in my own longing to know the Lord and to know Jesus through the Word of God, um, these are some of the things that I have learned. And so um, you will be able to see that there's a PDF that you can download, um, and it actually has fill in the blanks. And as I go through this video, you're going to be able to fill these in, and that way you have a resource for you to keep, um, maybe with your Bible study time, and um, you can feel free to use any of this as you wish. Um, and so... Before we start, I just want to pray just that the Lord would guide us in our time together. Father, I thank you so much that you have given us your word and that you reveal yourself to us through the word of God. Father, we thank you for your grace and for the gospel that saves us, Lord, and for the fact that you sent Jesus to come and to die for us. Father, I pray that we would never forget that and that you would open our eyes to the wonders of your word and that we would hunger after the word of God more than anything in this world. Father, I pray that you would give us um, wisdom and guidance as we go through this time. And um, Lord, that we would just hunger after you more than anything. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the reasons why we don't study the Bible is because we have a lack of understanding. Um, we see this as a big book and we have no idea where to start. That's one of the biggest things that women talk to me about is they just say, where do you start? Um, and we don't understand exactly how the Old Testament fits in with the New Testament. And so we see it as just a big task rather than a joy. Um, another reason that we don't study the Bible is because we have a lack of discipline um, to actually study and to actually put away our cell phone or wake up when the alarm clock goes off or put aside time during our day to spend time in the Word of God. Another reason is we have a lack of vision. Um, and so we haven't actually tasted and seen of God's goodness because the Bible is like a treasure chest and we're never going to be able to exhaust all the wealth in it. 
And so um, the more that we begin to taste and to see of God's goodness in the word of God, the more we're going to hunger after it. And it's going to replace the hunger in this world instead of filling up on things like cotton candy, which you know is not a good meal for you. It's going to leave you feeling sick. Sometimes we do that with the, with the world. We fill up on social media and all of these different things, movies, magazines, and we're left kind of feeling sick and wanting more. But when you fill up on the word of God, you are left satisfied and wanting more. And Jesus fills you in ways that you never could have experienced um, in any other way. And so whenever we have that lack, we have to know that God fills the gaps. When we when we lack understanding, um, we're told in James 1, 5, just to ask for wisdom and God will give to us generously. But we have to ask in faith without doubting. So simply, we've got to first ask God for wisdom, knowing that he is the giver of this good gift. The other thing is that we lack discipline. And so in Proverbs 12, 1, we read that the one who loves discipline loves knowledge. And so if you just open up Proverbs 1 and 2 and read these two chapters, over and over, Solomon was saying, get wisdom. He wasn't just suggesting it. He was saying, you have to get wisdom. This is the way of life. This is how we know the Lord. And so... Whenever we lack the discipline, we look at these things and we see that um, a runner doesn't just run a race. Like, they don't just show up at the starting line and run 26 miles. They train for it. They set aside time. They change their diet. And they do all of these things so that they can run the race well. And we want to do that as well. And I love this quote by R.C. Sproul. It says, he said, We fail in our duty to study God's word, not so much because it is difficult to understand, not so much because it is dull and boring, but because it is work. Our problem is not a lack of intelligence or a lack of passion. Our problem is that we are lazy. And so we want to get over this laziness that our culture has put into us and and have discipline in our life to know God. Um, Another thing, when we lack discipline um, or when we lack vision, it's also because we haven't seen how amazing God's word is. Um, Maybe we've read other things that just are never going to satisfy us the way the word of God does. In Psalm 119, 18, I love this prayer. And it says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. We need to ask God that he would open our eyes to his wonderful ways. And I love um, this quote that's on your sheet by Oswald Chambers. And he said, get in the habit of saying, speak, Lord, and your life will become a romance. And so we can pray that prayer to the Lord whenever we come before him. And so we've gone through some of the excuses that we have and seen what scripture says about those and what the answer is. And now going back to the excuse, a lack of understanding, um, a lot of us just don't even know how the Bible is put together. And so we're going to go through just a few of the basic things just to know whenever we open up the word of God. And so um, one thing that I, I grew up in a church and I didn't even realize until a few years ago that the Bible is not in chronological order. I thought that every single book, the way that it is written, um, that that's exactly how it took place. But really, um, that's not exactly how the Bible did. Even in Genesis, whenever you're around the time in Genesis 12 and Abraham, that's also when Job comes in. Well, you see that that's later. That's more in the middle of your Bible. And so um, for us to know that and to start thinking, okay, how was the Bible put together chronologically? And we're going to talk about resources that can help you with that. Another thing is the Bible is 66 books. It's divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament. However, these two things are not totally separate things. They, they link together. The Old Testament points to New Testament. The New Testament points to the Old Testament. Both of them are sharing one story about Jesus coming to save us from our sins. Um, and so the Old Testament, it was actually written in the language of Hebrew. And um, there are 39 books, and it's divided into five different sections. One of them is, um, the first section is the first five books of the Bible, which are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And those are referred to as the law, and they were written by Moses. The next next section is the historical books, and I'm going to have all of these in the blog post. The next one is the poetic writings, the major prophets, and the minor prophets. And so all of these books go together, and they're all showing that man needed a savior, And the people were waiting for a savior. They were waiting for the promised one that the prophets had told them about. And we see in the New Testament, the promised one, Jesus Christ comes. And so the New Testament was actually written in totally different languages. It was written in Greek and some in Aramaic. And it's made up of 27 books. And um, it's written or it's divided into five different sections. So first the gospels, then it talks about the history of the church. Then the Pauline letters are also known as the epistles then also the general epistles, 
And then lastly, in the book of Revelation, prophecy. And so in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there were 400 years of silence where the people of God were waiting anxiously for the Savior to come and to rescue them from their sins. And then we know that when Jesus came, he came in a totally different way than they had ever expected. And so there's also different translations of the Bible. Um, some are literal, some are more thought, um, are more thought provoking. And so there, the NIV, the NASB, and the ESV are some of the closest translations to how the Bible was actually written. And so these are ones that people generally um, recommend for you to read from. And I use the ESV Bible every day. Um, but then also some of the other translations I use when I'm studying just to learn kind of a fuller picture and see maybe different ways that it's worded and what what's being said there. And one thing that we know is obviously the Bible is an old book. It has stood the test of time. It is written by the Lord. Every word of God has been inspired and the Bible never changes. However, it's always relevant to us. Even though this book has been here for so many years, we can still read it and it applies to our life today. But one of the important things we're going to address is we need to study it um, based off of the context and the history, and we need to know what was going on in those surroundings rather than just picking and choosing. It's good to have a whole um, broad view of the Bible and to see that it is actually one story. And so as you move on through, um, through your PDF that you have, we're going to move on to the next section that the Bible is, it's actually one story, and, um, and it's a story of redemption. I love this because as girls, we love to, we love love stories. Um, we love romance and all of those things. We love, we grew up hearing um, in the beginning, once upon a time, and then we absolutely get excited at the end when it says happily ever after. Well, the Bible was written the same way. In the beginning, God created all of creation and then he sent Jesus to come and save us. And in the very end, we're told that he's coming back for us just like a prince and that he is rescuing us and he will reign eternally. And so the Bible is the greatest love story of all. Um, I love this, this quote by Paul David Tripp explaining the Bible. He said, the Bible is a narrative, a story of redemption, and its chief character is Jesus Christ. He is the main theme of the narrative, and he is revealed in every passage in the book. This story reveals how God harnessed nature and controlled history to send his son to rescue rebellious, foolish, and self-focused men and women. That's you and me. He freed them from bondage to themselves, enabled them to live for his glory, and gifted them with an eternity in his presence, far from the harsh realities of the fall. I love that. That is the perfect description of the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And so we also learn that the Bible is not an encyclopedia for our issues. It's not a divine self-help book. It is the answer to our need, and we need Jesus. So the Bible, a lot of times um, we look for it. I remember whenever I was waiting for my future husband, I searched all over the Bible for a verse on waiting for your future husband. Well, that doesn't exist in the Bible. However, the concept of waiting is all throughout the Bible. And the concept of being satisfied in the Lord and finding my identity in Him and in not in another person is all throughout the Bible. And so there are certain things that we'll go to and say, well, what does it say about that? But God gives us the answer. He gives us the overall answer to our need, and that's Jesus. And then through that, we have all the other answers to our life. And so... Um, there's a lot of things that, that we can even just learn practical things about our life, but overall the Bible gives us the answer to our need in our life and that we need Jesus. I love um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, that it says that we, we have the Bible so that we may be complete and that we may be equipped for every good work. And so God answers every one of our needs in the inspired word of God. And every single word that is in this, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, has been breathed out by God, it's been tested by time, and it has been proven worthy to direct our steps. Lastly, the Bible is our hope. It satisfies our hunger, it meets our needs, it is the tool that God uses to guide his people, reveal his truth, and show us his way. I love in Revelation, I mean, not Revelation, in Romans 15, 4, um, we're, we're told that the Bible is written for our encouragement, our perseverance, and our hope. And so we can read it knowing that God put each word in there, each story, to encourage us. 
And then in 2 Timothy 2.9, we read that the word of God is not bound. Whenever we call to him and whenever we come to him, his word has the power to change us. And then in John 1.1, 1, 1, um, through the word, Jesus is revealed. Um, he was in the beginning of creation and the word of God was there too. So we can read the word of God knowing that every single word has been tested by God, breathed out by him for our correction, for our encouragement, and for our life. And so the next thing is how do we actually study the word? How do we come to the word of God each day? And so the first thing that we have to actually do is we have to come. We have to come it, just as we are, I love Isaiah 55, 1, and we see this commandment, and um, it says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Four times it says come, and he's talking about the gospel here. Isaiah is referring to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we can come just as we are. We don't have anything to offer God. Um, that's the next point that we're going to make is that we come humbly to the word of God because we have nothing to offer. He has everything to give us. We don't have to come with money. We don't have to come with something to give him. We just come as we are. And that is the grace of God. That is the gospel that we get to come to every day. And so the come is a command and it's associated with a promise. In Matthew 11, Jesus says to come to him all who are weary and that he will give us rest for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And so we know that when we come, Jesus offers us himself. And that when we come humbly, that we come knowing who we are and that we are nothing and that he is everything. And then next we come secretly. In Matthew 6, um, Jesus is preaching at the Sermon on the Mount. And he talks about over and over that what is done in secret is what honors the Lord. It pleases the Father. And so we come secretly. We don't tell we don't have to broadcast it every single time that we're spending time in the Word. We can spend moments with Jesus that nobody ever sees. Moments in prayer, moments in the Word, moments hungering and singing and praising and all of these things that that pleases the Father and He meets with us. The next thing is that we come hungry. I love um, this verse in Jeremiah 15, 16. And um, the prophet Jeremiah was talking about eating the Word of God. And um, let me pull it up. He says, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I called, I'm called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. And so we come hungry to the word of God. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus also talked about, he said, blessed are the ones who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Then he gives a promise. He says, for they will be filled. And so we're supposed to come hungry knowing that Jesus, he's going to fill us. He fills us with everything that we need. And even in Isaiah 55 that we were just reading, he talks about coming coming to buy, buy, to, um, to buy food to eat and that we come hungry knowing that he fills us in ways that we could never even imagine. And so the next thing is to come expectantly. So we come knowing that Jesus is going to answer us. In Matthew 7, 7, he says to ask and to seek and to knock, knowing that the door is going to be open to us. So we come confidently and come expectantly, knowing that God is going to answer us. In Jeremiah 33, 3, um, he says, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you did not know. Um, I have clung to that verse so much as I've come to the word of God, knowing that he's going to tell me things that I didn't even know before. Um, because we, the truth is we can study a verse for years. I mean, you can read the Bible every single year throughout your entire life, and you're always going to be discovering new things because God's word is living and active. The next thing is we come prayerfully. We come knowing that prayer is a gift that God has given us to communicate with him. Um, we pray scripture. We pray confidently. We pray in faith. But we also don't put our faith in prayer because a lot of times whenever we're praying and we're expecting God to do things, we're putting him in a box saying, God, you have to do this this way. But whenever we come praying to him, knowing that he is a good God and that he does, the th he does things for our good and for his glory, then whatever the outcome is, we can leave it in his hands knowing that he did what was best because he loves us more than anything. Um, I love 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. It says to pray without ceasing. Literally, pray all the time. Pray continually. And um, I've given a lot of different verses that have all of these promises with prayer that you can, that you can look up in your own study time. And the last thing is we're supposed to come openly. 
Come ready to learn. Come with your heart in your hands like this. Let go of everything that you're holding on to and say, okay, God, I'm coming to receive everything from you. I'm coming letting go of everything that I'm holding on to, and um, I'm coming with open hands of worship. And so um, I love Lamentation 2.19 that says to pour out your heart like water before the Lord. It's this beautiful picture of us just coming and spilling everything and him listening and then him giving to us the things that we need. So you can come and just pour out everything before the Lord. So not only do we come, but the word of God also, it, it compels us. It tells us to go. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus gives us the great commission and he says to go into all the earth and to preach the gospel. And so we go, we leave our time in the word, we shut our Bibles and then we go and we live this. And the next thing is we go urgently. And so the, the message, it compels us to share with the world um, what we've learned. We're supposed to share the gospel through our words, through our life, and through the message of, of Jesus. And this is not something that we keep to ourselves. It's something that we want to share with the entire world. Um, next, we go purposefully. And as believers, we have a mission in this life. We can do everything to the glory of God, whether you are raising children and changing dirty diapers, or if you're traveling, or if you are at a day job, anything that you can do, you can do with the glory for the glory of God. And um, Paul even says in Philippians 1 21 that to live is Christ and to die is gain. So literally living equals Christ, living equals Jesus. So we go with a purpose to make Jesus known and to know him. Next, we go joyfully. Um, in this chapter in Isaiah 55, you really should spend some time here because it is an amazing chapter. In verses 12 through 13, he says, For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. I love that. Go forth in joy and in peace, singing and sharing the gospel through our lives. Next, we go prayerfully. So not only do we come prayerfully, but we also go prayerfully because we know that we have a mission in this life and that we need the Holy Spirit to guide us as we go throughout our life. We also go boldly because we know that he is with us. Um, in First Peter, we're told that we are given every single thing that we need all the things that we need for life and godliness. Actually, I think it's Second Peter. But he says that, um, that God has blessed us with everything that we need. And so we can go forth in this life knowing that he's going to equip us, that um, even in times where we don't know something to say, that he's going to give us the words to say. Um, I'm going to pull up that verse really quick. It's Second Peter 1, 3. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, who called us to his own glory and excellence. Um, that whole chapter in 2 Peter 1 is amazing with that. And then also we go obediently. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus says that we're supposed to follow him. We're supposed to deny ourselves every single day, take up our cross and to follow him. So we go obediently. We go with that whole intent. I love um, Jonathan Edwards always prayed this prayer, Lord, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. And so we can leave our quiet time with that very prayer that God would stamp eternity on our eyeballs and that we would live for what is to come and not just for the things that are right in front of us. And so those are the first few things that we're going to cover in our first video on being well-watered women, women who are watered by the well of the word of the word of God, that we come and we hunger after him more than things of this world. And in the next video, we're going to talk about some really practical ways that we can actually study the word of God. So um, we've talked about excuses that we make. We've given the answers to those. We've gone through um, how the Bible, just the different basics, that the Bible is actually one story. And then we've talked about how we come to the word of God and how we lead the word of God. And so I look forward to you joining me um, in this next video as we hunger and thirst after him and as we um, learn practically how we can spend time with him every day. Thank you.